Listener supported. WNYC Studios. Hey there, podcast listeners. Ira here. You've probably heard me say this before, but it is so important, I need to say it again. If every one of our two million listeners gave Science Friday just one dollar each year, we would never have to ask for money to support our programs. Can you imagine that? One buck a year. Well, you can't blame a geek for dreaming. So if you have a dollar to spare, or maybe 20, please consider supporting our show. Your donations will pay for the basics, keeping the lights on in the studio, keeping me flush with pens I use to write dad jokes on all my scripts, even this one. So please go to sciencefriday.com give to make your donation. Every bit helps make a difference. sciencefriday.com slash give. And thanks. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. A bit later in the hour, we're talking about the most important science issues in each state, from wildfires to flooding, maybe renewable energy, even dry cleaning chemicals. Yes. And we want to know what's the biggest science issue in your state, maybe your local community, maybe your town. We'll be taking calls, and our number is 844-724-8255, 844 844- Seven two four eight two five five. You can also tweet us at SciFry. But first, prepare to say goodbye to an old friend. For nine years, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope has been orbiting deep space, giving us an unprecedented look at, at the objects within it. But this week, NASA announced that Kepler has finally run out of fuel at the end of its life. That means the agency will soon be sending its final command to the telescope, shutting it down permanently. Here to tell us about that story as well, maybe better, more hopeful stories, Amy Nordrum, who's editor for the IEEE Spectrum. Hi, Ira. Kepler is nothing to be ashamed of. Does no, Kepler no. has succeeded uh, its mission. It has actually surpassed NASA's original expectations. Kepler was NASA's first original exoplanet hunting mission. So exoplanets are those planets that exist outside of our own solar system. When the Kepler mission was first conceived, we didn't even know of a single one. And now Kepler has helped us build up a catalog of potentially as many as 4,000. Uh, it's confirmed the existence of 2,600. And even after it shuts down, its data will be used to confirm uh, what's expected to be many more. Because there's all, there's all that stuff we haven't analyzed yet. You Absolutely. Find... Yes. It, yeah, it's continued to send down data even while it's on its kind of last legs of its mission. And scientists Scientists will continue to analyze uh, that information. And then just in April, NASA launched its uh, next version of Kepler. It's known by its acronym TESS, and it'll continue on with Kepler's uh, mission to hunt new exoplanets. Is it going to be going out there exploring deep space? It? Yeah, it has yeah. a little different orbit. Kepler was actually orbiting uh, around the sun, kind of trailing the Earth. And this new mission uh, will actually orbit around the Earth in a very elegant uh, orbit. And it'll be able to look at whole whole por- portions of the sky, whereas Kepler was sort of focused on a more narrow sliver. So the hope is that uh, it continues to build up that catalog and helps us explore new worlds. Yeah, it was a very exciting mission. We wish all those mission specialists you know. Good work. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Let's move on. There, there was a surprising study out this week about farmer's markets. Tell yeah. us about that. Yes, Penn State researchers um, visited farmer's markets around the state and basically watched whether vendors were following common food safety practices. They wanted to know if the food that uh, people, people were purchasing there was safe. And some of these practices include, you know, wearing a hair covering when you're handling food, uh, wearing disposable gloves or washing your hands in between handling food and money, uh, and placing vegetables on surfaces that can easily be cleaned. And they found that for the most part, vendors at farmer's markets think that they're doing a good job at these things, but they're actually not. So the most common violation that they witnessed was uh, vendors handling money and then switching over to produce without changing Mm. their gloves or washing their hands. And this is something that can transfer diseases. And then fewer than uh, 24% of vendors used a hair covering. So they thought they were doing it, but they weren't. Yeah, they also surveyed vendors, a different group of vendors, uh, and said, you know, what are your food safety practices? What do you do when you go to the market? And a lot of them said that they did these things, but uh, their observations uh, proved mm-hmm. different. So they were moving all that back, what, E. coli, that kind of bacteria? Yeah, yeah. They, they sampled a number of the different items at these markets to see if there was an impact. And so they um, found E. coli on 40% of the beef samples that they collected, 28% of kale present at these markets, and 17% of spinach. And so, uh, you know, one takeaway for consumers 
consumers is it's definitely important to wash your vegetables uh, no matter where you buy them. But they're also hoping that this research will inspire new food safety trainings, particular to farmers markets, because a lot of these vendors will go through trainings, but they're kind of the, mm. the general training meant for restaurants, and they're not particular to the circumstances of a market where you don't have access all the time to running water and electricity, and you're working out of a tent. Yeah. Do we know how, that, how it compares to your supermarket? Well, they did study a comparison of chicken. So chickens sold at markets and chickens sold in the grocery store, and they found more contaminants on the chickens sold at markets. And they think that this may be the result of a federal law that um, allows you, if you produce fewer than 20,000 birds a year, to be exempt from certain uh, regulations mm -hmm. like having an antimicrobial program in place. And so they think chicken might be especially susceptible to that. Um, they're not sure if it's the same for veggies. Gotcha. Next up, for people who uh, like to take charge of their health, two consumer health stories we should be following. Tell us about Tell us about the first one. Sure. The first is that 23andMe this week received uh, the okay from the FDA to produce a new report about how consumers' genetics might influence uh, the way that they metabolize certain medications. So this is the first direct-to-consumer report of its kind, and it'll measure uh, three dozen variants across eight genes that have been shown to affect how your body metabolizes medicines. So the report will tell you if you're a fast or slow metabolizer of about 50 prescription and over-the-counter medications. And in some cases, when evidence is available, the report can tell you whether you're likely to experience uh, reduced efficacy or side effects of these medicines. But it won't tell you what your ultimate health outcome will be. It won't, yeah, and it won't tell you what to do. So <laughs> that's the limit do. here. I mean, the idea, and this is yeah. definitely part of this trend in medicine toward what's known as personalized medicine. So our bodies all process things differently. That's, you know, food as well as medicine. And if physicians could know exactly how you or I process mm -hmm. these things, they might be able to tailor medications or treatments more particularly toward us. But this report is really a starting point. It's not something right. that consumers would be able to take and apply. Um, it's still important for people who have this report done to talk to their doctors. And the yes. FDA and 23andMe both uh, emphasize that in their announcements. Let's talk about your, your second consumer health story is about... Well, this is a report that came out of this week's meeting of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. They had their big annual meeting in Chicago this week, and one of the presenters there took a look at a different consumer tool. It's WebMD. Um, this is a, a website that a lot of people use uh, to look up their own symptoms and kind of self-diagnose their conditions. And WebMD has a feature on their site called Symptom Tracker. Um, or symptom checker, and it lets you type in your symptoms and basically returns you a list of possible diagnoses that are associated with those symptoms. And th these eye doctors who did this study were like wondering how accurate those diagnoses uh, were, and then also how accurate the next steps that the program suggests are. And they found that this tool is not very accurate. So they ran 42 different um, scenarios through the tool and found that the tool only included the correct diagnosis in its list less than half the time. And it mm. only put it at the very top about a quarter of the time. So if you were a consumer and you're using this tool to kind of self-diagnose or make decisions about what you should do next, you would be wrong the vast majority of the time. Go see a doctor. <laughs> Another <laughs> takeaway. Go yes. see a real doctor. Yeah, it's important to do your own research and try <laughs> yeah. to be informed, but that that is definitely still we're important. We're not quite there yet. No. AI medicine. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Amy Nordrum, news editor for the IEEE Spectrum. Always good to have you. Thanks, Ira. Now it's time to play Good Thing, Bad Thing. Because every story has a flip side. You know the ocean can be a noisy place, and when you consider all those motorboat engines adding to all the sounds of life below the surface. So how do ocean animals adapt to this increase in volume? Researchers found that bottlenose dolphins off the coast of Maryland are actually changing how they speak to each other, their calls, making their whistles simpler to be heard better through this background noise. Their findings were published in the journal Biology Letters, and here with the good and bad about that is Helen Bailey, an author on that study and also research associate professor at Chesapeake Biological Lab in Solomon's, Maryland. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, it's great to be here. So, so the, the bottlenose dolphins are simplifying their calls? They are. So just like us, if we go to a, a noisy bar, if you're trying to talk to someone, you have to usually get closer and someone asks you something like, oh, where are your keys? 
And you say, yes, they're, they're in my pocket. And you're there like, what, what? And you just start yelling, yes. You just simplify <laughs> what you say so that they can hear you better. Uh, and that's what these dolphins are dealing with. They're like in a noisy bar under the ocean. I'll bet you. Uh, and we have a clip of a dolphin whistles that you collected. And it, basically, it's a double clip. First, we're going to hear at the beginning just the dolphin calls. And then you'll hear a change when the dolphin's calling with boats in the background, give you an idea of what it sounds like. Wow. What? <laughs> it's Dr. noisy. Wow. Uh, yeah. if, if the, I can see why the calls have to be simpler. If they are simpler, does that mean there's less information in those whistles? Are they communicating less efficiently? Um, they certainly do talk to each other a lot. They're very social animals. They're producing these whistles all the time to talk to each other. So they're really important. And yet, as you can hear, with all that background noise, it, it's very difficult to communicate and we're concerned, you know, perhaps that could have implications for, for the group and particularly for things like mother cat, calf pairs um, who are trying to stay in contact. You know, if I were in the middle of all that noise and we all have our own street noise here as humans, it could be very stressful. Do we know if the dolphins are getting stressed by this noise? They could well be. There was another study a few years ago after the 9-11 events showing that right whales uh, were less stressed after the events because there was lower boat traffic, it was quieter, and the animals were less stressed. So it's very likely that the dolphins experience that too. Just like we don't like living in a noisy neighborhood, it may be stressful for them as well. Mm -hmm. And, and do, uh, do they change their behavior then because of all this noise? Uh, well, we have these, um, these hydrophones that we have are these underwater listening devices. So uh, we knew that the dolphins were calling even when there was loud background noise. And it was only when we looked in more detail that we saw these changes in the calls. Uh, and so what we want to do next is look at specific types of whistles, those that we call signature whistles, which are like their names. They call out to each other. They say who each other is and also their feeding behavior to see if any of that is changing when we have this background noise. Mm -hmm. So is that what you're going to be looking at next? It certainly is, yes, because at the moment we can tell the good news is the dolphins do seem to be adapting. The fact that they can compensate for this background noise is good. Um, but the trouble is when you have a lot of noise 24-7, is that going to be start to be detrimental to their health and their ability to feed? So mm -hmm. that's what we want to look at next. Yeah, that is the good news and the bad news. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Hey, thank you very much. Good luck with your research. Helen Bailey, Research Associate Professor, Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. That's in uh, Solomons, Maryland. We're going to take a break, and after the break, we want to know what's the biggest science issue in your state. Coming up this election week, I mean, you've been voting already. I mean, what issues are on the ballot? What issues are affecting not just your state or your county, but local communities? People are going to be voting for their local officials. Uh, plus uh, some contenders from, well, we'll talk about them, from net neutrality in Nebraska to opioid abuse in Kentucky. It was just announced today opioid deaths are at an all-time high. So we'll be back after this break. Stay with us. Our number is 844-724-8255. We'll be right back. This is Science Friday. I am Ira Flato. No matter what state you are voting in, chances are... Science, health, energy, or the environment is on the ballot, whether that's in Alaska, where protections for salmon spawning streams is up for a vote, or Illinois, where congressional candidates are fighting over who is more invested in protecting the Great Lakes. Even if there's no option to blacken a bubble on a ballot, science policy will be decided this election cycle. Decisions that will put into the hands of whomever wins a 2018 local gubernatorial or congressional seat. So what are the science issues in your state or community that, that you want your politicians to pay attention to? Let me start. Let me start the conversation with this one about chicken farms. I am Justin from Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and my biggest issue I've seen in this area is the massive increase of chicken houses polluting our water table. It has also diminished our water table. It's caused a lot of air pollution. And I would say that's probably the greatest issue we are facing here in rural northeastern Oklahoma. Hmm. Well, chickens may not be an issue in your state. So, so what is helping helping me steer this ship today? Is Sophie Bushwick, 
Senior Editor at uh, Popular Science. Welcome to the Co-Pilot Seat, Sophie. Thanks for having me. And we want to hear from you. What's the biggest science issue in your state? Our number, 844-724-8255. You can also tweet us at SciFry. Sophie, PopSci did some special reporting on science in the states, correct? That's right. We looked at all 50 states as well as Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. and tried to figure out what is the key science policy facing this state so we could kind of bring science to the forefront of voters' minds because politicians don't always address science issues when they're on the campaign trail. Yeah, they have to be asked, don't they? Yes, they do. Uh, climate change, for example, is a big issue. It, face, it, it can affect, it has the ability to affect every single state, and yet you often find politicians sidestepping the issue, not wanting to comment on it. Mm-hmm. And in, in, in surveying all these states, were there any any single things that stuck out, any surprises to pop side people? Uh, one of the things that really I found surprising was in Hawaii. So Hawaii is in the middle of the ocean, which makes it a great place for wind energy. And they've actually set a really ambitious goal of being in, of being entirely on renewable energy by 2045, which is great. But on the downside, it turns out that these wind turbines are not so good for the Hawaiian hoary bat. This happens to be the only native land mammal in Hawaii. It's endangered, and it is is kind of defenseless against these wind turbines. It just flies right into them. And so um, the state is mulling forcing these um, the wind energy producers to, to put some protections in place for this mm-hmm. little bat. Mm-hmm. Lots of tweets and phone calls coming in. Let me go to uh, the first tweet. Uh, uh, this one is from Lindsay, and she says, Water, 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 drinking water, storm water, wastewater, groundwater, r- rising sea level, coastal stem flooding, rivers flooding, et cetera, et cetera, plus all the things we like that live in the water, fish, lobster, seaweed, everything, water. Water is a major issue. It came up again and again and again in states uh, all across um, the the, all across the continent. So, Mm -hmm. for example, here in New York, um, there's an issue with the infrastructure that's used to deliver drinking water. So um, some estimates have said it will require 40 billion with a B dollars to um, take care of improving the treatment centers and the pipes that carry this water. Uh, The state legislature has only earmarked 2.5 billion. Mm-hmm. Let's go to the phones. You can call in. We'd like to hear from you, 844-724-8255. Let's go to Terry in Sebastopol, California. Hi, Terry. Hello. Uh, my major concern is the movement of the Mojave Desert north of San Francisco. We're drying. We're flaming. We're flying. We now have Southern California spiny lobsters living north of San Francisco. Never before in the history of California, ever, even in the fossil records. That's my concern. We are turning into a desert. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Was that right? Thanks. Thanks for the call. I mean, warming temperatures and climate change is is exacerbating drought and um, also wildfires Wildfires. in a lot of states. Yeah. So, um, for example, in New Mexico, they're having a lot of issues with drought and drought really goes hand in hand with wildfires. When it's dry, things are much more prone to burning. Yeah. When I was in Utah earlier this uh, this summer, Mm -hmm. that was the biggest wildfire. You know, they they sort of cycling around the Southwest. Who's got the bigger one this week? (laughs) Because they're everywhere. It's a contest nobody really wants to win. Let's go to Guy in Portland, Oregon. Hi, Guy. Hi, how are you? Hi there. Go ahead. I haven't spoken to you in a long time. Anyway, it just came out that off the Oregon coast, they've just declared that there is a hypoxia season now. So... You know, the ocean warming is getting to the point where uh, everything on the bottom of the ocean is dying because there's no oxygen, and it's really hitting our crab fishermen badly. So, Okay. Thanks for the call. I mean, we when we talk about water issues, we've been talking about fresh water and drinking water, but this is definitely an issue in oceans as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, salt water issues, when you've got a lot of runoff, those mm-hmm. nutrients can encourage um, algae blooms, which will pull the oxygen out of the water, which is no good for the other creatures that live in the water. Um, so that's definitely an issue. Yeah, and especially in, in Florida, algae blooms is ballooned that's... up so to speak, <laughs> as an yes. issue yes. this year, right? Yes, definitely. Florida has had a real problem with that this year. 
Mm-hmm. And we also have some really uh, unusual stories. I mean, li- little ones you wouldn't, you, something about uh, dry cleaning fluid in those days, right? Yes, this one was fascinating. So Kansas had a, a, an area where hundreds of residents for the, apparently the past six years have been bathing in and drinking water contaminated with a dry cleaning chemical called PCE. So it turns out that back in 1995, um, the state passed a, a law that was lobbied for by the dry cleaning industry that encouraged regulators to overlook this chemical's presence. And it it turns out it has contaminated um, the water in this area above the level that the EPA deems safe. And in Mississippi, you you talked about bridges being a problem. I was surprised more than 500 bridges in Mississippi have had to be shut down because they're no longer dangerous. And this isn't just an issue for people who need to be able to get to work. This is an issue for people who need to be able to go to the doctor's office. I mean, transportation across the state relies on people being able to drive over safe and reliable bridges and mm-hmm. it's a it's a big problem whatever happened to those infrastructure plans to <laughs> rebuild america and all those highways and bridges and i mean like <laughs> yeah. you would you would hope that we would there would be federal support as well as state support for this because i think infrastructure it definitely is a problem that crosses state lines all over the place absolutely let's go to uh, alpena michigan hi matt welcome to science friday uh, hi. Hi. Um, hi. So, uh, my name is Matt. I'm from Michigan. And what I wanted to talk about was an invasive species that you've probably all heard of called the Asian carp coming into the Great Lakes. Um, as you know, the Great Lakes are the single biggest allotment of fresh water in the world in one spot. But yeah, there's that one crazy lake in Russia that's bigger than Superior. We're, we're not going to talk about that one. But... Um, it's it's a big deal. Um, it could be the single greatest threat to the natural fisheries in the Great Lakes that the Great Lakes have ever seen. And um, have you have you seen yeah. them? Have you go, seen go, them yourself? And, go on. I'm sorry. Have you seen them yourself, Matt? Have I seen them myself in the Great Lakes? Personally, no, I have not. They haven't made it quite this far north yet. Yeah. Um. um there's been reports. Again, I, I use okay. I'll use reports in quotation marks. There's been quote unquote reports, right? I haven't personally seen them. This is hearsay, of course. Um, in in um, around Chicago and stuff yeah. like that, they're yeah. coming in. They're coming in the ports down that way, coming in from the rivers and the ports and everything. Yeah, yeah. We've heard, we've seen people from Illinois talking about this. Yes. In- uh, I've also heard people advocating that one way to deal with invasive species is that we should try to encourage people to eat them. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. We uh, we had a, a a call from Nevada. I want to go to this call from Nevada with uh, concern about nuclear waste in in uh, Yucca Mountain. This is Venus from Reno, Nevada. My concern relative to science in Nevada is the Yucca Mountain Waste Repository, which is built on the fault lines. Nevada is the third most active state for seismic activity. The potential for radioactive waste reaching the water table is not a risk to be taken lightly. This area of the country is already water sensitive. Contamination, even in the far future, would have lasting effects on our planet. Yeah, we've had that. That's just been an issue for decades. They've been uh, talking for 30 about 30 years. I remember way back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, back uh, under President Obama, it was kind of tabled and, and it's been dormant for a while, but it's becoming a, an issue again because people are sort of saying we should be expanding nuclear energy to, to phase out reliance mm-hmm. on fossil fuels. Um, but if you've got nuclear energy, you need a place to put that waste. And so this debate. I mean, I don't know. It could maybe rage on for another couple decades. Could. Let, let's zoom in closer to uh, one of the few states with reporters from our State of Science series. And let's go north, Sophie, to... Shall we go to Alaska? Let's go to the far north. <laughs> north to Alaska. Um, our reporting looked at the risks to caribou calving grounds and federal lands uh, that might be open to fossil fuel extraction. That was reporting in Popular Science, right? Yes, uh, the the land where the caribou live and rely on, even if only part of it is developed, people worry that even mm. a small area would be enough to disrupt their migration patterns. But but there's another issue on the ballot that has been hotly contested, and Elizabeth Harbaugh from Alaska's Energy Desk at Alaska Public Media is here with more. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, thank you for having me. Tell us about this. 
So this ballot initiative, which has kicked up a heck of a fight here in Alaska, um, in a broad sense, what it would do is it would beef up the permitting system for developments that overlap with salmon habitat. So we're talking a lot tougher vetting process for mines, for dams, for oil developments in salmon habitat. And I should say salmon habitat in Alaska is quite extensive. Um, and Alaskans would also get more notice and opportunity for public comment for projects in salmon habitat. So more of a chance to object to projects like this. And why do people say salmon need more protections? So it's really hard to understate the importance of salmon in Alaska, um, not only economically, but symbolically. Um, Alaskan salmon account for like 40% of the wild salmon caught in the world. It's home to the world's largest wild salmon fishery and most valuable wild salmon fishery. That's the Bristol Bay salmon fishery. But also it's hugely culture, salmon is hugely culturally important um, for Alaska native people. Um, they catch them and rely on them for their diets across the state. And so salmon is, is something in Alaska that really transcends political boundaries um, and you really we won't hear anybody in Alaska saying we shouldn't protect salmon that that is consistent for everybody here but, but, but there is some opposition what are they saying there's more than some opposition. There's huge <laughs> opposition to this. Um, so the oil industry, the mining industry, unions, Alaska Native corporations, um, they've raised over $12 million for a campaign wow. against this initiative. That's more than any of the governor's candidates combined. Um, and their argument, they believe this goes too far, um, that this is not the right balance between development and salmon protections. Um, they think it opens the door to litigation. And, and one thing they really don't like about this is this measure would limit something called off-site mitigation. Um, that is, you know, right now, if a development kind of overlaps with salmon habitat, they can go and fix um, another, you know, clean up some salmon habitat somewhere else in a different water body. This this would limit that. Um, and, and that's one of the key yeah. things about this initiative that they really don't like. And so um, the resistance has been quite intense. And something else I should say is, you know, the oil industry is uh, hugely economically important to Alaska. Um, oil taxes and royalties fund a significant part of the state government here. Um, when oil prices crashed a few years back, uh, it was really a gut punch to Alaska's economy. And so, you know, that <laughs> that that's why when they say that when the oil industry is like fighting this initiative, it, it is giving a lot of Alaskans yeah. pause. I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Here with uh, Sophie Bushwick. Hi, I, I had another question, sort of speaking of the oil industry. So if there is oil and gas drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, we, we mentioned that this would put caribou calving grounds under threat. So I'm wondering, is this something that's on Alaskan voters' minds at all? So it's interesting, um, Alaska politics, the way they work, uh, there isn't a candidate on the Alaska ballot right now that is against oil development in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, both candidates for Congress, both candidates for governor um, are supportive of it. That's kind of how Alaska politics goes, because I just explained, you know, mm -hmm. such a huge part of the economy here. Um, you know, that said, interestingly enough, voters in the lower 48 uh, might have more of an impact on this because if Democrats takes the House, um, a congressman from Arizona, um, Rule Grijalva, um, he would become the chair of the House Resources Committee. And he has said he would really push back on development in um, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So while it's not something Alaskan voters will really have a big impact on in this election, um, voters in the rest of America really yeah, could. Yeah, it depends on those committees. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, for taking time to be with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Elizabeth Harbaugh, reporter for Alaska's Energy Desk at Alaska Public Media in Anchorage. We have a couple of minutes before we have to go to the break. 844-724-8255. Let's go to uh, Media, Pennsylvania. Hi, Jim. Yes, hello. Hi there. Go uh, ahead. I, I thought my line went dead there. I was trying to figure out what went on. Uh, my question is a simple question. Anytime they have a city uh, that exists anywhere in the country, they have to have wastewater treatment programs set up to handle the population. Why do we not have that anywhere for uh, poultry farms, uh, beef development farms, uh, anything that, you know, excretes waste should be forced to go through a waste treatment program. They should not even allow them to be built unless they have those accesses there and you know they're 
taken care of. People are getting sick. The red tide exists because of wastewater treatment. So you think that, that this should be? You think this should be an issue then on ballots everywhere? Oh, wow. definitely, definitely. If if they can, if they have to have wastewater treatment for people's excrement. Why don't they have it for critters? Now, we saw that uh, come into play a little bit, or at least get some attention during the last hurricane that went through uh, North Carolina. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah, one of the hazards of those storms is that they can breach containment um, walls and systems, and you can get even bigger contamination if you have farms where their waste ends up spread all over the place in the wake of a storm. Yeah, we saw that uh, with with the ash from coal mining also, not just the containers, just the Coal ash is another big contaminant in a couple different states. So this is after coal is burnt, you need to get rid of the leftover ash, and that can um, re- can leach into groundwater, and you don't want the arsenic and other, other um, poisons in there getting into the water supply. No, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> no, no, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> not to make, not to be a little. It's very, very dangerous. Absolutely right. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a break. Uh, we want you to stay right where you all are. Our number eight four four seven two four eight two five five. You can also tweet us at Cy Fry. Uh, Sophie Bushwick and I will be back after the break, and we're going to talk about uh, some interesting stuff. How about this as an issue? Meat labeling in Missouri. Renewable energy in New Hampshire and our top science story in your state, whatever it is, you can make the call, but only if you make the call. So we'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. We're talking this hour about the science issues on the ballot, or at least on your mind, in a state-by-state tour of the U.S. this midterm season. And sitting in with me is popular science editor Sophie Bushwick. Pop Sci recently ran a story identifying the top science policy issues in every state. And if you'd like to join in, our number is 844-724-8255. You can also tweet us at uh, Cy Fry. We have a whole bunch of tweets that came in. Let me go to a few of them before we we go back to the phones. Uh, one from Connecticut, yeah. A tweet from Lena who says, the arrival of two new tick species in as many years. The most recent arrival can reproduce asexually. Both bring you know, fun new diseases too. Yay us. This is the home... Yeah, you know, uh, tick diseases. Oh, Lyme disease. Oh, Lyme. Lyme well, disease. on top of Lyme, Lyme disease, there's yeah. a certain kind of tick whose bite can um, cause a meat allergy. So if you get bitten by this tick, you'll develop an allergy to red meat, which nobody really wants. <laughs> no. All right, so let's let's go back to your survey, Sophie. Where do we where do we go next? We're gonna pay a little visit to Missouri, where the state recently. Speaking of meat, they banned the use of the word meat on the packaging for anything that's not an animal product. And Chris Husted, a reporter at KBIA in Columbia, is here with more. Hi, Chris. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. So what got Missouri so desperate to regulate fake meat products in the first place? Right. Well, Missouri is an agricultural state. It's an $88 billion industry. And a lot of that industry is from pork and beef and poultry producers. The food industry is fairly powerful, and they they like to lobby for their own regulations, so it it helps them out. Um, So on one side, you have the meat producers and farmers who want to protect their industry against this new burgeoning market for non-meat products. Those are the plant-based proteins, if you will, that are based from soy and other types of plants that um, that are tr- want to use the words that are associated typically with meat, like sausage or hot dog or ground beef. So this is kind of trying to get ahead of the curve uh, with, with uh, food labels to set that standard for the state before the federal legislators can come in and try to do it themselves. And are there a lot of fake meat companies in Missouri that might have problems with this? There are some, and uh, that's kind of what's created this problem uh, that's uh, been exacerbated by this labeling law. Um, one of the biggest companies that you'll hear of uh, is Tofurky, which is the uh, company that makes the vegetarian turkeys that are popular with people who are interested in that type of food uh, during the holidays. So these companies are not happy that they're going to have to accommodate this new label uh, because their industry is just developing. What if they spell meat differently? Or turkey, different. You know, I'm I'm serious about this because we have cream-filled things that are not real cream, and they spell it C R E M E. Right. Right. I mean, have they thought about that kind of getting around the law? Well, there are certain types of uh, words that are being allowed. So if it says plant-based meat, then that won't be as challenged as much uh, than certain words that are just trying to, uh, I guess, 
what they uh, assume is going to trick the consumer into thinking they're actually buying a different product. So I haven't seen anything yet about uh, tricking people with the spelling of the words, but I'm mm-hmm. not, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see that. And there, there's a lawsuit already, right? There is a lawsuit, yeah. So to- Tofurky and also the American Civil Civil Liberties Union, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and the uh, Good Food Institute have sued the state of Missouri. This is just a month or two ago, saying that this law violates the First Amendment and that uh, it'll, it prohibits these alternative meat companies from using words that consumers actually understand. So at the core of this, you see the consumer used as the pawn to try to move the uh, pendulum toward whichever side they want. Uh, whichever side wants the words regulated their way. And do you think we'll see similar labeling rules coming up in other states down the road? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, In 2016, Vermont had a GMO, so genetically modified label law, that all the states inevitably had to fall in line with, because if you want to sell your product in that state, you have to abide by those laws. So for Missouri, if this law stands, then other states who want to market and sell their products in the state of Missouri will have to abide by this labeling law. Uh, until a federal law can come around and set the standard for the entire country. We've seen some challenges also in California with using the word milk. So soy milk or almond milk, the dairy industry doesn't like that because they think that's fooling consumers as well. Uh, And there's been some challenges there. So until a federal law is set, states are probably going to have to fall in line with what Missouri's done. Mm. Thank you so much for filling us in, Chris. No problem. Chris Husted is a senior reporter at a KBIA in Columbia, Missouri. Our number, if you'd like to call in, lots of phone calls, 844-724-8255. Let us go to Duluth, Minnesota. Hi, Chad. Hi. I'd like to bring up the topic of mining and the, and the mining of copper, nickel, and rare earth elements, such as cobalt. Go ahead. Um, there are... there. The technique of mining that pulls these minerals out of the ground creates uh, a highly toxic tailing that needs to be stored for perpetuity. Um, and, and so there is a, there's a threat to the water resources in the region. But I, so there's the science behind that, but I'd also like to get behind the science of what these elements uh, feed as far as our needs for future technologies, electric cars, uh, telephones, uh, and those those types of things. Yeah, you got the boundary waters, all kinds of stuff coming into play there. Uh, exactly. I, 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 are any of these things on the ballots that you know about, or should they be? I think that it's a hot topic, particularly in in northeastern Minnesota, uh, District Eight, mm-hmm. uh, and and both that that is up for election. And I think uh, being that northern Minnesota is is a background of resource based jobs. Um, particularly in the mining sector, there's there seems to be a, a a head-to-head battle between those who seek to invite and protect the environment and those who want the jobs. It's a predicted predicted economic impact to the region, which is which is a, now a poor region of of a Super Bowl every year for the next 20, 20 years. Um, but the but the environmentalist folks argue that that it's just not worth the risk because this toxic tailing needs to be held in per- perpetuity. Um, yeah. And so I think yeah. a lot of those voters are going to be turned out based based on that issue. All right. Good good topic. I mean, the conflict between uh, preserving environmental uh, re- regions and and the, the economic incentive to mine them is definitely a theme we've seen uh, elsewhere as well. So, for example, Delaware is really reliant on tourism. Mm-hmm. Um, so they really don't want offshore drilling to happen because you don't, first of all, it's it's unsightly if you don't want to go to the beach and see an oil derrick. And then the other thing is that uh, it, th- there's the worry that there would be spills and that could really damage the tourism industry. So it's not just about um, maintaining the environment for residents. It's also about helping encourage other people to visit and to spend their money in the state. Mm-hmm. It's not a state, but Puerto Rico is on. Your list, right? Puerto Rico is still dealing with the um, with the hurricane damage, and they will be for for an in, the indefinite future. They've actually the governor has actually encouraged uh, Puerto Ricans who are living in other states to vote for candidates who will support um, federal money going to Puerto Rico because there's only so much that they can do on their own. That's really interesting. Um, uh, all kinds of it's, it's amazing how many issues are all over the country. You know? Yes, that really crosses state lines in, in in very interesting way. So each state has its own um, specific 
combination of factors going on, but you see these themes coming up again and again. I have one more state that I want to zoom in to and go before we have to say goodbye. We have one more state, and that is New Hampshire, which has a lot of issues, but uh, but energy is, is one of the biggest. And here to explain is Annie Ropik, environmental reporter at the New Hampshire Public Radio. Hi, welcome back. Hi there. So tell us about uh, what's hot, the uh, hot topic in your state. Yeah, energy is really the big one. Uh, this has been a huge issue, really an economic issue in our governor's race and our congressional campaigns this year. Um, we have some of the highest energy rates in the country. Our bills are actually kind of more middling, and that's a you know important distinction. But the wholesale prices that we pay for energy uh, on, on the wholesale market are really high. And obviously, we use a lot of energy here. It's pretty cold, and we're a net importer of things like natural gas. Um, so this is a big issue, and it's something that voters are really interested in, you know, both for economic reasons mm. and for climate change reasons. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about where our energy should come from, how we should support renewable energy development and, you know, uh, disincentivize the use of fossil fuels, how involved the government should be in that. And it's a, a pretty clear partisan issue and one we've heard a lot about this year. Uh, the, in New Hampshire, the governor recently vetoed a bill that would uh, boost solar power. Um, why would he do that? Yeah, that's right. It was a bill that was supposed to expand uh, the ability for mainly towns to do net metering where they can uh, generate their own solar or hydropower and sell it back to the grid. Uh, that was a really controversial veto. It's something he took a lot of, our governor took a lot of heat from, especially from Democrats. Uh, he said that it would raise rates too much for consumers, although his math on that is sort of up for debate. It's honestly never really been settled just exactly how much that could raise rates or how that cost might be passed on to consumers or not. Um, that had pretty broad support from, from obviously renewable energy developers, but also towns and, and individuals who, who want to be able to take advantage of installing and, and benefiting from more solar power and, and mm -hmm. are sort of limited in how much they can do that right now. Is Governor Sununu running for re-election this year? Oh, yes, he is. It's his uh, first re-election for a second two-year term. Governors in New Hampshire almost always win that first re-election, but he does have a Democratic challenger who's hit him really hard on renewable energy issues. She supports a lot more renewable energy uh, development than he does, or at least subsidy for that development. He says, you know, let the free market play out as it will, and if renewable energy is the best solution, then it will come to pass, although you know, free market is kind of a relative term when it comes to energy because fossil fuels are heavily subsidized, too. So, um, you know, that kind of is easier said than done. Now, there, there's state lawmakers recently passed a measure <coughs> requiring uh, utilities to buy more from biomass plants. Not exactly a measure that will address climate change, will it? No, I mean, that's a good point. That's a really device of an interesting issue. You know, environmentalists really don't like biomass power because they say burning trees for fuel, you know, does more harm than good. But a lot of forestry people in our state, which is really heavily forested and we have a, a working timber industry, uh, they say, you know, it incentivizes us to manage the forest well. So it actually means that we won't clear cut the forest and develop them for housing if we're able to sell some of that lower grade wood for biomass. So in the long run, it's better for climate change because it means you maintain the big forest stand. It's it's a really divisive topic. The science, again, is is somewhat unsettled. It depends on how the biomass is being done. And it, theoretically, it can be good. But, you know, in practice, it's often not so good emissions wise. Um, but our our timber industry is is politically pretty powerful in this state. And so um, they managed to get that bill through over the governor's objections. Again, he said it would raise rates for consumers and it will uh, in the short term. But, uh, you know, long term, mm -hmm. there's a lot of political debate about the future of biomass and timber in this state and in northern New England in general. I know biomass proponents do say that um, even though it still emits, um, it still has emissions, it has far fewer greenhouse gases than fossil fuels. So it's it's maybe um, a quarter of the uh, equivalent carbon dioxide that you'd get from burning oil and maybe a fifth that you'd get from burning coal. Yeah, it's it's far lower sort of the traditional greenhouse gas emissions, but it's mm. it's more of the particulate matter. And interestingly, like trees will sequester more of the bad stuff that's in the air, like heavy metals and things like that. So some opponents say that uh, burning biomass is actually contributing to, you know, really serious air contamination, not just carbon mm. dioxide emissions, but sort of harmful smog in, in some of these more concentrated areas where they're doing a lot of this uh, this burning. Well, Annie, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Annie R Ropik is environmental reporter at uh, New Hampshire Public Radio. We'll have a busy week next week, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios.
Wow, this hour went by fast. It did. It, uh, let me just sum up. Uh, you you mentioned politicians who don't want to talk about climate change as real policy issues for their state. Um, and, and, and people are just uh, avoiding it. But maybe so, it's finally getting some legs, this <laughs> You, you would know, hope so. I think that with the with the extreme weather we've experienced with hurricanes and fires and droughts, I think that it's absolutely becoming necessary. So in places, for example, Florida, uh, state legislators don't really like talking about climate action. And so local um, local authorities are finding themselves having to to do the heavy lifting there. And so they're just sort of ignoring the the um, the state. Uh, mm. regulations and being like, we're, if we don't make our own regulations, we'll be in trouble. But you, And you can see how a lot of these state issues, environmental, whatever, are going to become national issues the longer we talk about them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think some of them are already national issues. So we mentioned infrastructure. I mean, we talked about wanting a federal infrastructure bill, and infrastructure is a big deal. Um, so in Massachusetts, for example, the pipelines that carry natural gas are aging and those are going to need infrastructure investment in order to, to keep working and to not um, mm-hmm. to not you know cause a lot of damage um, and the other thing is air quality is transcend state lines literally Connecticut actually has really bad problems with air pollution (laughs) and that's not their fault that's because they're they're they happen to be at the the end of a jet stream that's just (laughs) delivering pollution right to their doorstep and that's an issue they can't fix on their own my doctor mentioned that to me the other week we were talking about air pollution (laughs) living in connecticut sophie it's been great having you here it's been great and if people want to see the whole study they can see it online your whole report that's right at popside.com so uh, and and sophie bushwick is popular science senior editor and uh, thank you again for taking time to be with us and spending our time with us it's been my pleasure Sure. One last thing before we go. We were sad to hear this week of the death of coral researcher Dr. Ruth Gates, director of the University of Hawaii's Institute of Marine Biology, and a fierce advocate for protecting reefs as the oceans warm. And in 2017, she spoke with us about the future of coral reefs. But even on the heels of the worst coral bleaching event in recorded history, she was optimistic about the capacity of humanity to slow the course of climate change and save the corals. We are projecting that the majority of the world's reefs will be dead by 2050 if we do not really start to address the drivers of climate change. And, you know, when I say that out loud, Ira, I have to say it's just heart-wrenching because these systems are so beautiful. And, frankly, the solution is so simple. It's not that complex for us to lift this big collective effort that it will take to reduce fossil fuel burning. It's just not Mm. that difficult. That's the wonderful thing about this problem of climate change. It is a solvable issue that everybody can be a party to. And in some ways, it creates the greatest challenge of our time. And I think that humans are incredibly good at solving problems, and so we just need to activate and do it. Dr. Ruth Gates, a great advocate for the oceans, passed away last week, and condolences to her loved ones, her colleagues, and everybody who knew her. Charles Berkowitz as our director, our senior producer, Christopher Intaglietta, our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, Katie Heiler. We had technical and engineering help today from Sarah Fishman, Kevin Wolf, and Rich Kim, and uh, of course, we are active all week, all on social communities and all over the place. You can send email directly to us if you'd like. SciFry at ScienceFriday.com. Also, we are active Facebook, Twitter, every day.